we just had a beautiful outline of these flows of capital on the top end, and I wouldn't be uh, looking at the bottom end because I think the technosphere dishes out very different kinds of tokens to different populations. And um, when I look, when I have this 10 minutes to talk on the financialization or the present state of rationing technologies, um, I will take it up from the 1940s again to now and um, describe what is probably financialization as a parody because the people first to use these tokens um, belong to the poorest billion, um, those who are eligible for or uh, need uh, food aid or uh, vital uh, support. And it is more on the level of poor economics that this token I'm going to talk about is acting out. Just very briefly, you have in rationing in the 1940s three different options. Of course, you can hand out the material itself. You need the logistics. We know everything about surplus dumping, and this was uh, a, a thing um, in, in the 60s and 70s, but then it faded out. Another way to do it is commodity rationing. And here I think it's interesting how this token works because the symbolization or the, the level of abstraction differs from what money would do in that you have 500 grams of sugar. You know, it's, it's a very, very direct indexicality that this token has. But on top of it, it's of course a non-market allocation. So every econo economist writing about rationing tokens um, dwells on the fact that there's a central agency deciding who gets what and what gets distributed how, and it's an alternative allocation mechanism, so not a market. Of course, already in the 40s, um, Lionel Robbins and uh, I think Keynes too were keen on developing point rationing systems, and here you have the normal market, but you have the points that stop you from buying if the central agency doesn't want you to. So it's really curbing buying power, this point rationing system. And um, of course, some of you may think, okay, this is already very governmental. Shouldn't we, um, shouldn't the financialization or cash-based cash rationing be um, the default method? And isn't it better? Um, we will see. Um, I will walk you through um, this situation that you've probably seen is very, very often in the media, the Zatri refugee camp in northern Jordan. They've recently got um, a 33 football field large uh, new field of, um, for, for supplying the area with power because predictions are that the camp will be there for a long time. It used to have 100,000 inhabitants um, part of them, I mean, half of them children, now the no numbers are lowering a little bit, but still there's nothing you have to ration. How is this done? Um, 130 international agencies pool there and try to, uh, I don't know if that's a governmental structure, it's probably more of a chaos, but they're sort of responsible in some way. And um, the World Food Programme that was founded out of the um, Food and Agricultural um, Organization is the main actor when it comes to food. Of course, there are other people, uh, other organizations doing this, but the bulk is on a daily basis um, done by the World Food Program. What do they use? People come, they come across the border, they uh, are received in those tents, and of course, the first thing is registration. And here it is interesting to see that I think we are on, on, on the verge of something um, the old methods of registrations, which used uh, fingerprints and foot uh, pictures in progress databases, are being replaced by something that's called BIMS. Um, the company running it is Accenture, um, located in Washington and Arlington, right next to the Pentagon. So they have a very biased um, idea, I guess, of what who should be registered, how biometrically, and the new BIM, uh, BIMS that database is, of course, um, geared towards biometric capture of people who are probably not even registered in their home countries um, and who get uh, or have to receive aid. 
It's an iris scan and fingerprint uh, combination. And every night, these, um, in this technology is geared towards uh, working in the desert. Of course, you, um, every night you can store very many data sets on it, and then it's linked and channeled, and then we have one firewall, and it goes to Geneva on a global scale. I mean, the World Food Program has, of course, operations running everywhere, not just in northern Jordan, and this data is uh, sent via every channel towards the central database. Once you're registered, you can enter the camp, and um, still there's in-kind rationing. Very, uh, yeah, it costs a lot of time. Of course, there still are some paper vouchers. These are from Zatri camp, which in the beginning used paper vouchers, which are in the um, agencies are very, very good at um, evaluating their own um, modes of transfer, and, and statistics say that this is very favorable for women, for example. So once you start financialization, financing, financialization rationing, um, it tends to end up in the head of uh, men. The main achievement, and it was in the Daily News in Germany as a, as a very, very good um, development, is the one card. Here you see one that is uh, issued in, um, by the World Food Program in combination with MasterCard, Visa card, um, provided these cards too. Of course, they're a bit more smart than our usual uh, credit cards. They have 3D holograms and barcodes, and um, to enable enforcement, they can store all kinds of data. And this is, um, of course, very, very helpful if you have 130 donors, they can all book wallets into this one thing. And it's, of course, good in another way if you're a refugee and you, you are at a cashier, um, not only in camps, I mean, some, some live in cities, it's less discriminatory. But um, as Gerald Nestler was um, mentioning the other day, in a way, there are people who are too poor to be indebted, and what do they get? They get a credit card, and they're heralded this is heralded not as um, food aid, but as food assistance. So um, suddenly you do not have any capital, but you're sort of uh, you're an entrepreneur with this card. So it gives a very, very um, weird role to the person who obtains the card. Most crucially, probably, that there is um, the scope platform lies behind, behind this one. It can register biometrically too. But what it can register is not only the information of who got how much, but it is technically possible to say that um, who did what after he received a ration, and that's the big change. So with financialization of rationing, you have not only the technological change, you have a change in the mode it is done, because um, a tendency, and that's a global tendency when it comes to social nets, um, building uh, social nets in, in states, you have no longer an unconditional transfer. That was the mode um, from the 40s, but you have conditional cash transfers, um, CCTs. And these CCTs um, say, okay, once you got your daily ration, please help us build this large um, field of solar generators, or please dig a well, or please um, send your children to school, please. Um, do an uh, IT course, please vaccinate your children. So, as you can see, and this is why I would call it um, a money that has a different dimension. You cannot only make things that are usually uh, work-related, but you can steer behavior in a way. So, it may be um, due to um, Amatia Sen's uh, capability turn and um, the new ways of, of creating environments that are nudging people into certain behaviors which are very, very much discussed in development politics. And I think this is sort of nested into the card once it becomes a cash-based transfer, which is, in a way, um, the weird news. So, of course, it doesn't stop here. Um, you can pay in um, the supermarket, um, it's of course a Safeway supermarket and a Tass Wheat supermarket from Jordan uh, with your iris. So we can, well, I guess we're safe to say that these persons become their own tokens or that their identity is somehow um, not infringible anymore because 
the World Food Program is dealing a lot with resettlement fraud, which is an interesting um, new way of de doing illegal things that you um, yeah, register twice or something. Another way, just if we leave the camp, um, it's not done so much in Jordan, but um, the smart ways of conferring rationing to people, of course, in, because of the African development, are very often transferred via mobile phone. And behind this is this success story of M-Pesa in Kenya that many of you may know. Airtime, so the time you spoke to somebody, turned into a token or was tokenized and turned into something others could redeem for money, and that was across countries, so it was a very, very useful development. And, um, of course, the World Food Program uses this technology, too. And just this August, um, the back end is no longer done by um, Visa and MasterCard so much, but there are um, tendencies to use the blockchain, uh, the Ethereum blockchain, for saving all this information in the field and saving it in distributed ledgers, of course. So that may, again, diminish transaction costs. Probably everything here is narrated as a success story in this field because, of course, you, you save costs at every end if you use this new technology. Um, I've read only one evaluation that said, okay, maybe all this technology costs something too and maybe it's not working all the time, but in the end, um, there may be uh, good reasons that the World Food Program does it, but as Katja linskov jakobs and, and um, um, Christine Bergatova Sandvik have shown for the um, accounting practices of the um, UN High Commission on, on Refugees, tech, uh, the accountability there is on the highest level, so they really know everything about every movement, and um, they b both maintain that it's not only probably a bad uh, thing or a difficult thing for the people on the ground, but that this may be probably a laboratory for future types of money. So that was what I wanted to add to end up in the present. Thank you so much.